Okay, picking up where we left off on the bottom of page uh, 527, we're talking about security levels. And so they talk about the security. We're talking about the the operation center, you know, the the server room particularly, you know, even desktop computers. If if you have like a an open office scenario where somebody can walk in the front door of your business, walk up to the the welcome desk and there's a computer there and if they and if that person is helping some other computer they can just I mean helping some other person they can just walk around the corner and see what's on the screen yeah physical security for everything and then of course you have portable computers it's a completely different set of rules for portable computers um, most port people now uh, encrypt the entire hard drive on these portable computers there's lots of ways you can use Microsoft's in internal uh, system they have where you can get third-party software to do it so when you fire up the laptop you have to log in with usually with a cat card or a thumb uh, print or perhaps just a, a password and uh, that'll get you into the system and you can see what's going on on page uh, 529 they basically talk about you know network security again uh, yes I want to encrypt traffic uh, that leaves my organization if, if I'm using the internet between you know the Chicago plant and the Atlanta plant then I'm going to use some sort of encryption between the two so no one can snoop in on the conversation again physical security is associated with this as well you know where are your uh, network boxes you know where's the rack there's a 19 inch rack somewhere at this end of the building is it in a secure location and then wireless networking. Wireless produces such a tremendous amount of effort uh, for the security people that most people don't do it. What they'll do is they'll have like a free wireless access that only goes to the internet and does not connect to the network at all. So that visiting people can come in. You can go in the conference room and fire up uh, your machine and hit the internet, but you're not hitting the corporate network at all. Most people if they care about security do not allow that type of connection uh, wirelessly it's just too much of a risk I mean yes of course you can use you know virtual private networking and all sorts of things over wireless to to make it better but to tell you the truth um, you know the um, you know the three sides of the triangle uh, that'd be one where availability yeah I'm willing to, to take a hit on that to, to not have it uh, so yes on page uh, 531 they talk about network security you know virtual private network makes it tunneling between two points with my own secure little way so no one can eavesdrop in on my conversation and there's firewalls and there's network intrusion devices um, we had those uh, at my previous place of employment where uh, if somebody turned on a, a wireless device and connected to our corporate network if it was possible in other words they uh, they jacked into the wall where the corporate network was and turned on a, a wireless access point. Well, this would detect that the access point is acting on the LAN, and the alarms would go off and the cops would come. So network intrusion detection. Um, on page 535, they talk about uh, application security. Yes, when you're doing an application, you have to have levels of security, and it has to make sense, and you have to have some way of managing that. And typically, we're talking about, you know, adding a user to a piece of software. Uh, so a new employee got here, and you add a, add a user, and what rights do they need? Oh, well, this this person needs read access to this and write access to that. So you know, you would set up, set up your application to allow you to add those kind of things. And when you talk about Windows itself, you know, Windows has services running behind the scenes, and these services typically run at higher privileges than normal applications so when somebody wants to target a machine they often target services or they'll try to get you to install a service using uh, your administrator rights so if you're an administrator and you got fooled into installing a service uh, yeah wow you've got something running behind the scenes now that's uh, doing dangerous things you can harden machines and harden applications and turn ports off and turn services off and you know, there's an entire checklist. You can get the NSA even produces a list of here's what you ought to turn off on your machine as it comes from the factory. Okay, and then across you talk about you know little things like uh, input validation, make it practically impossible for me to, to screw up my you know make it impossible for me to, to delete a table accidentally. In the example I just gave before, 
patches and service up, upgrades, those kinds of things. Um, you know, file security, yes, you can do encryption on a file. You're going to do an encryption on an entire disk. Uh, you can do an encryption on an entire laptop thing. Uh, and then of course you can get permissions of course to do those things. Uh, user security. One of your, what you're trying to do is this, this concept of the concept of least privilege. Uh, you set permissions for a user for the, the least amount of permission they need to do their job. And if they need elevated per permission to do one function, you don't give them the entire next tier of permission. You, you carve out a niche, so to speak, and give them just the permission they need just to do their job. So it's a more surgical approach to providing them only the things that they need. And again, it's not that we don't trust them, that they're you know spies or something. It's not the point. The point is, um, I feel, for example, I had this one uh, Oracle database where I was not an administrator. I was just a plain old user. And I would poke around looking at tables. And they would say, um, well, you know, why don't we just go ahead and make you an administrator? I go, no, 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 <laughs> no. I want to be able to poke around here and try stuff, knowing full well that I cannot damage anything. Because I'm going to be poking around and doing stuff, and I do not want write permission on this table. Thank you very much. Okay. So a lot of this has to do with, you know, how do you identify someone? You know, we're talking about the multiple factor. Um, if you just have a username and password, all you, you can log in basically with, with, with what you know. And if someone else knows the same thing you know, then they can impersonate you. Two-factor authentication is, you know, what you have, like a, a, a smart card, and what you know, your PIN number. So you physically have to have something, and you have to remember something. So when you walk up to, you know, a cyber lock to get into a secure area, you swipe your card, and then you punch in your PIN number. Boop, 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 and then the, the door magically unlocks, and you go in. Two-factor authentication. There are three factors of authentication. There's biometrics and retinal scan and fingerprint and all the rest of those things. Uh, and none of this is foolproof because, you know, you can always have a, a failure. And social engineering is the best way. Uh, they tell stories about they uh, hired this company to, uh, to do uh, penetration testing, you know, ethical hacking, um, penetration testing on this uh, bank. And uh, what they did is they uh, went to the break room and... Uh, uh, left a basket full of uh, thumb drives saying free thumb drives from you know this vendor and they went oh cool so two or three of the bank employees grabbed the thumb drives went back to their computers plugged them in infected their machine with a virus that was on there and then the guy came back the next day and said okay you know I broke it into your system you know here's how I did it and it was all because social engineering he knew that it was going to be irresistible to have a, a free thumb drive and people are going to plug it in and play. Okay, uh, on page 540 they talk about uh, procedural or, or uh, operational security. These are sort of like the rules and the rules are, uh, you know, your screensaver has to kick in if it's, you're gone for more than so many minutes and you have to log out and you know all these kind of things. It's, it's the, the set of, they're not necessarily computer related, they're more people related. Here are the rules. You know, shred documents and do this, and you know, go through and all the list of the procedures. Um, and of course, the whole idea of need to know kind of comes into that. Don't don't provide someone a secure document if they don't have the, a need for a secure document, because more than likely they don't have a way to store secure things. On page five forty, the now we're switching gears and we're talking about backup and recovery. And so um, there are policies you can put in place for doing backup and recovery. Um, they talk about the backup media and it used to be that what you did is you went and bought a tape drive and you put you know tapes in there like 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 a VCR tape stuck it in ran the thing and you were up and running um, tapes became t the price of tapes never really went down in fact the tape the cost of tape drives skyrocketed at the same time, the cost of hard drives just kept falling and falling and falling and falling and falling. So, for example, I could buy, you know, a, a gigabyte uh, hard drive for, you know, 100 bucks. But to get a one gigabyte tape drive plus 
a hand, handful of uh, gig of one gig tapes would be five or six thousand dollars like wow so a lot of people have moved away from using tapes uh, they're kind of slow hard drives are dirt cheap and incredibly fast um, what we would do is we have these uh, removable hard drive uh, uh, ports on the on the front of the computer and so you open this little door you take a hard drive and you stick it in and close the door and as you close the door it locked the drive in place and it would spin up and you got a drive letter then you do all your backups to this drive letter and then shut it down and pull that drive out and go put it um, in the off-site storage anyway uh, that's relatively cheap and uh, a heck of a lot faster than tape drives okay uh, nowadays a lot of people are just backing up to the cloud they're just saying hey I'm gonna send this over the wire um, the amount of backup you do could mean that's just not practical now for example if, if you've got I don't know 13 terabytes of, of RAID storage and uh, you say well I'm gonna send that over uh, to the cloud uh, yeah it might take about a week to send that up depending on how fast your 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 internet speed is so yes you definitely need to look at you know how long it's going to take for that to work now admittedly if, if you're doing different types of backup storage it could take a long time that first time and then it could be synchronized and, and take less time from that point on so they talk about full differential incremental and continuous I'm gonna skip the middle two full backup sounds exactly what it says it's a uh, I back up absolutely everything and send it on off so it's a full backup absolutely everything and then the other one is the other extreme is continuous which means as I'm operating my machine I change a file it, boop, it sends that one off to the backup someplace typically in the cloud and as I delete a file or change something or add a new file or copy it it constantly just keeps maintaining so I'm only a few seconds behind on uh, all my my backup storage now let's talk philosophy for a minute and um, here's a saying that I used to say just to, to to get people's minds working I would tell them there is no value in doing a backup backups alone have no value whatsoever the value is in doing the restore okay makes sense right if you don't ever do a restore uh, you'll never actually see what the value is you'll be going through this procedure and you're doing all your stuff and if you don't ever do a restore you never know now let's go back to those middle two categories of backups yeah they talk about the um, differential and incremental what I tell people is if you have an opportunity to make it easy to do a restore then cho choose that method to make it easy to do a restore not make it easy to do the backup because backups I mean we, we ran them in the middle of the night on the scheduled task we come in the morning and switch the tapes out or switch the hard drives out I mean there's hardly anything to do but when something fails then alarm bells are going off people are screaming management standing in 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 your office saying how long is it gonna take to fix that you know nervous crying. Ah, nah, 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 nah. that's the time to make it the easiest not the most complex so we would do for example full backups and we would exclusively do full backups knowing that if we had a failure I could load the, the full backup hit the button and walk away and not have to sit there and swatch tapes out when it got to the end you know insert tape number two insert tape number three uh, if I had a full backup I could put one tape in and walk off okay so enough philosophy about that but uh, just to think about that there's no value in doing a backup okay uh, this is coming up on the 15 minute mark and so uh, we'll pick this up again in just a few